not used to that. Uh, so if we're in the middle of summer here, we go there, and, it's, and, it's just, and they, on the other hand, though they'll say, yeah, it's hot, are a little more accepting of that. So you can start to play with these things. So this just shows you that comfort has a lot of things going on. It's not just the thermostat on the wall behind you. Uh, it's also the radiant effect. You know, you have cold window surfaces that make you feel colder because you're losing heat to them. Or do you have warm surfaces overhead because you're doing heating with warm air or with warm uh, radiant panels. I'll talk about so it's radiant heat down to your body. So you start to think about temperature differently. You have air movement. You have drafts. Or do you have just a nice little air movement across your body in a natural ventilated building that makes you feel more comfortable with the space temperature on the wall? So thinking of comfort a little differently. So not to get technical on you, just a little bit. Um, ASHRAE, do you know ASHRAE? American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, um, have an adaptive comfort model that they say is you know, reasonable to think about if you're doing a naturally ventilated building design. And so here, this is, this is temperature in the space. This is the mean outdoor temperature. And at different times of the year, the mean outdoor temperature is going to be different. So this is a monthly mean. And then this is sort of the acceptability ranges. So 90% of the people will be comfortable if you're in this range, 80% are in that range. So if the mean outdoor temperature is, say, 59 degrees, and it's summertime, um, well, you're going to be wearing less clothes. That's what this is. You're theoretically going to be comfortable up to about 70, you know, at 78 degrees outdoor temperature will keep you comfortable. And you might be still comfortable down at this range because of how you dress that time of year with that the average temperature. If it's 86 degrees is the average temperature outside, you're generally wearing less clothes, but you're also then adapted to that warm temperature outside. So you can get away with warmer temperatures inside and feel it's acceptable. It, that's, that's the argument. Think about that one. So anyway, so you can start to take advantage of this stuff if you're doing a naturally ventilated building. And, that, and the way you take advantage of it, you allow for the fact that, say, first thing in the morning here in the summer, in the winter, in, in the summertime, temperatures are usually in the 60s or 50s even. And then they warm up to maybe the 80s on a hot day. So if you open up your building at night and let the building cool down to 68 degrees, 65 degrees, you come in in the morning and it's still in the acceptable range for you. But you're going to accept the fact that over the course of the day or over the course of the week, if it's a, it's going to be, you know, the temperature's going to range a little bit. So we're just a little more accepting of it. We've gotten used to a constant temperature in the spaces that we don't have to. Okay, so here's my, here's my stick hand figure version of this. Um, so if you have, some bubble lines here that are closed, like those are, on a hot summer day, sun's hitting them, they're at 95 degrees or whatever temperature they get, because they get heated up by that sun that's hitting them. So my thermostat says it's 73. The guy, the building operator, thinks I'm doing great. The objects in the room are about 78 degrees, but this stick guy is feeling the heat from that thing, it's radiating to his body. And so there's a concept called mean radiant temperature, I'm not gonna define all the day to do that, but he feels a little bit warmer than the space temperature. So he's feeling like it's really 75 degrees, not 73 degrees. He walks over to the window. All of a sudden, that 95 degree surface is a much more, he's seeing more of that surface, or his body's seeing more of that surface than if he was way over there. So he's actually gonna feel warmer. So in this case, he's not quite as happy. It's about 79 degrees in terms of how he feels it. So, so from a comfort perspective, you might be calling the guy up and saying, hey, turn the thermostat down. All of a sudden, you're using more energy because he's turning the thermostat down. He says, wait a minute, it's 73 degrees. Why does this guy need a cooler? Of course, you open up the blinds. Sunlight comes in and hits you. Then you really feel it. And we'll talk about what's called operative temperature, OK? So 73 degrees on the thermostat, the result of your operative temperature and how you feel is a lot more in that case. So what's the cure? There's a cure. All of a sudden, you can block that sun. You can block it outside the building. 73 feels like 73. Everyone's happier or happier. All right, so this is one of the buildings I was talking about. It's 100% capacity and cool. I'm going to tie this in with net zero now. So this, there's a database out there, the CBEX database, Commercial Building Energy Consumption Survey. So this is information on existing buildings and how they actually perform. It dates back to 2003 now, and I won't get into reasons for why it's so old, but that's, what that's the baseline people are using by which they're looking at energy for different types of building types. So you can go into that and get a baseline for different types of building types and your different occupancy to say, this is what a typical building in Seattle or Bothell does. And so doing that, 85 kV used per square foot for years is what was, would be the target point. Code at the time the building was designed, if you use that ASHRAE model and just sort of take what you come out of it as soon as right, is about 62. 
this one was designed for 40. It's, what, if you look at the building, the entire interior is a big courtyard, so it's perfectly suited for uh, cross ventilation. It's perfectly suited for bringing natural light in. Not so great from the standpoint of heating, because it's got lots of lazy things. So now here's the question. Does this building be net zero energy? Anyone want to venture a guess? It could be made to be net zero energy. Okay, well, let's, let's see if anyone got any other thoughts? I, I don't think you're going to have enough room. Okay. You came in late, right? Okay, so you're on the right track. Yeah. You don't have enough roof area to put all the renewable energy you need to offset that much energy use. So this building, which is a great building, won lots of awards, people love it to be in it. You know, unless PV gets a lot more efficient or they find ways to further reduce energy in the space, which they've done a lot to already, because of the fact that they've got a fair amount of heating, because it wasn't you know, designed to be net zero, really couldn't make it. Uh, there's another building right now that's being built in, in uh, Seattle called the Cascadia Center. The Bullet Foundation did that. And they started with the center atrium, and then they couldn't figure out how to get enough PV on the roof, the atrium went away. And so, and their, and their EUI that they're targeting on their building is 16. So, that's very interesting. So, sorry. So, when you look at natural ventilation from the standpoint of all this, you know, this might be a concept of how it looks. You've got operable windows and maybe some operable louvers that often open automatically to provide a little fresh air if you forget to open the windows. And then you have some kind of efficient way of heating. In this case, I'm showing a radiant floor. And, you know, that higher rises and so you want to get it out, so you might do something like have a, a chimney or something, and you, know, you can do pretty good with this. But from a net zero energy standpoint, there is an issue with this. Uh, we are heating dominated climate. If you leave the windows open, what are you heating? The outside. You're heating the outside, right? So, the Z home. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> right. Your dad was absolutely right. So, the Z home, uh, we do, we, we are not, you know, you know, cooling and that kind of stuff isn't really a consideration around here at home, so there's no air conditioning going in anyway, so it's by definition. Right. So we did design it to try to mitigate some of the peak solar gains coming in and some strategies like that. But we've gone with this kind of strategy to provide minimal ventilation in the winter time. So and this is what's called a heat recovery ventilator. And basically it hooks up to all your exhausts, and then it has an intake to bring the air in. So as you, your bathroom exhaust runs, fresh air comes in, and there's a heat exchange between the two to recover heat. So we actually found, so that's a fan running, right? So the fan takes energy to do that. We found that in this case, because of how much heating we do, it's actually more efficient to put a heat recovery ventilator in terms of total energy, even though you take a penalty for having a fan running instead of just open windows, uh, because of the energy you recover from the exhaust air going out. All right, that's kind of an active strategy, but um, that's kind of the passive picture. I didn't talk about daylighting much. What I'll say about daylighting is that when you start to look at daylighting, it's just you know, look at your glazing percentages. You need to have somebody who knows how to do analysis properly of daylighting strategies and think about the visual comfort as well. If you just bring light into the space, it can create glare, it can create problems as well. So doing, doing good daylighting is actually difficult. And I know this is what you guys are about, but I could do a two-hour class on daylighting, but I don't have that exact thing. Um, and I'm not a daylight specialist. So active strategies. So now we say, all right, so we've done, we reduced our load, Insulation, looking at how much windows we've got, those kinds of things. And I got one other, I'm going to talk about those more here in a few minutes. You know, what are the moving parts? What are the fun parts? What are the engineers' parts that are going to make this happen for you? So, again, that same study I like to use as a kind of a grounding point uh, from New Buildings Institute. So, this is looking at, you know, what makes a difference when you're looking at HVAC or heat ventilating air conditioning. Again, the zero point, so if you use the code, this color is wrong. Right? Green means better. Orange is not so good, or if you see that as orange. And so what moves the strategy the most? What's the most important? Number one is the system you pick. So if you're picking an efficient HVAC system, or not an efficient HVAC system, it can move the energy for the, the needle a bit. Uh, interestingly, the second kind of biggest factor here is sizing. And I think that's probably, you know, that's not going to be where you guys are going. But just to give you the idea about this, um, does anyone own a home? Got one person, a couple people own homes. All right. So at some point in time, I don't know what kind of heating system you have, it may break down, and you may need to get a new one. And the contractor may come in and say, and, and he's got, well, you know, so we got the yeah, 30,000 BTU heater here. Let's make sure you're really set up. We'll put a 50,000 BTU in there to replace it, just because you don't want to ever have any problems, right? 
And you might say, oh, that's a good idea, more heat, right? Great. Uh, well, he's getting more money for that, but you're also getting a system that's not going to run as efficiently. Because if it's sized for 50,000 BTUs and you got a 30,000 or 25,000 BTU per hour load for cooling or whatever it is, you got equipment that's going to cycle more. Unless it can modulate down and run at a low, low position, it's going to be on and off, on and off, on and off, and it isn't going to run as efficiently. So what we call right-sizing your equipment becomes important if you can do it. And so, you know, if, if you had a home and you needed to replace your heating or cooling systems, and let's say there's a, you can almost be sure that what you've got in there right now is probably more than you need to do heating in terms of the capacity of a furnace. So you might even challenge the guys to go down a size, because it's better to run something a lot rather than have it cycle on and off. It also affects the service life, how long your equipment's going to last if it goes on and off a lot. It won't last as many years either. Um, yeah, I wanted to just to make sure that we, we did do a lot on HVAC system sizing, distribution, layout, Great. and all that Great. stuff. So just to give some context for it. No, that's fine. Yeah. Is there anything you want to add based on what I said? No, 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 no. Yeah, it's good. I know you don't know a few of the people here. That's why I was trying. Oh, to that's right. Those guys. Those, those are the computer people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm like, wow, you guys are just proud of that. So heat recovery, which we're using on Z Home, makes a difference. Your distribution system, you know, and I'll talk about that in a second here, and some other things. So, if, so referencing something like this can be helpful again to know where you really should be spending your time. So this is an image I like to use when you talk about a building like this size of a building. You're going to have almost 90, nine times out of 10 if you're in the United States, maybe 100 times, 99 out of 100 times, a forced air system delivering heating, ventilation, and cooling all through that diffuser up there. Um, it takes more energy to deliver energy to a space or deliver heating and cooling to a space air than it does with water. So this is kind of, just kind of intuitive. When water carries more heat capacitance in it or cooling capacitance in it. So if you can actually decouple ventilation for air quality from your heating and cooling, there's some advantage to doing that in a building like this. And so in this case, it takes a lot less power and a little tiny pump to move, let's say, the amount of heat you need to heat this space relative to the amount of fan power it would take to do this. So you can get into some interesting strategies. I know you've talked about HVAC systems, so I won't talk a lot about the specific strategies, but the concept, I, and I don't know if this is a term you've used as well, I like to talk about low temperature heating systems and high temperature cooling hydronic systems. So I'll talk about what that means very briefly for the HVAC people on this side of the room, and I'll make it more relevant in a second for everyone else. Um, if you're providing cooling in a large building, a lot of times the way you do it is you use what's called a water chiller. And the water chiller is going to make 45 degree water, 40 degree chilled water, distribute it out to a box that has a fan in it and a heat exchanger. It's going to run that cold water through that heat exchanger and the fan's going to blow air across that heat exchanger like the radiator in your car. Produce cool air, it's going to come out right there. Uh, 45 degree chilled water takes more energy to produce than 60 degree chilled water. You don't have to do as much refrigeration of the water. So if you look, there's certain technologies out there right now where you, if you deliver the water to the space, you can use 60 degree water, 65 degree water. So it's a more efficient way to do it. Likewise, if you're doing heating and you have a boiler to build, a lot of times they design the boiler to create 180 degree water for heating in the winter time. Um, a low temperature heating system, let's say a radiant floor heating system or a radiant ceiling heating system, which is this, where you're distributing water to the space directly, you might only need, in a well-insulated building, 85 degrees, 90 degree water. So it's much more efficient to produce water that hot than water at 180 degrees. So I talk about low temperature heating and high temperature cooling strategies, and all those strategies are going to entail putting in things like a chilled beam, is what this thing is, mounted up in the ceiling where you're distributing, basically you've got a heat exchanger there, or radiant panels where the panel itself replaces your ceiling tile, you've got copper tubing chemically bonded to the back of it, and you just circulate water through the copper tubing, and you can put some 100 degree water there and feel quite comfortable in terms of offsetting your loads if you haven't done a good job. So that's one way to reduce it, plus you get rid of that fan energy. Uh, the one consideration is that this is a typical air system, a VAV system, or, or and, and what it has is you can put more and more air into a space to offset bigger and bigger loads on the perimeter. But we're trying to reduce the loads on the perimeter. A radiant ceiling panel only can do so much for you because you, you can't you can only put so many panels in to cover so much cooling, and then you run out of real estate. So the more efficient strategies like chilled beams, chilled and 
filled ceilings where you're using hydronic rather than forced air, their peak heating cooling capacity is less than the cooling capacity of a big fan that you can just put more and more air in space. So if you're doing an integrated design for a high performance building or a Z-home Z building, and you've done your job on the envelope to make the load less, all of a sudden you can use a more efficient system. So in order to enable a more efficient HVAC system, you need to do a better job around the perimeter, and then you can do it, and you can do it more cost effectively. Uh, all right, I'm gonna move right along here. So integrated facade design performance, just to give you the idea, am I going to do it too deep on some of this stuff with these guys? Are you guys follow most of this? I didn't even cover a lot of this stuff, actually. He's not his head a lot over here. I just want to make sure. Okay, all right. Uh, these are the things you have to think about. Uh, so we talked about getting loads down to, to do this. The other thing, if you get those perimeter loads down, we showed the little stick man before with the sun coming in. You can offset those kind of things. People are going to be more comfortable. So a thermal analysis of the perimeter determine what shading might be needed or what strategies might be needed to make sure that people standing by the windows or working by the windows are comfortable more, as well as to reduce those peak loads so you can use those high performance strategies. And then if you're gonna do that, you're gonna need to do some shading analysis to know when the sun is where it's at. You might wanna do some daylighting analysis to figure out if it's gonna be visually comfortable for people in the space. You might wanna do some daylighting analysis to figure out when you can turn the lights off. And then you're gonna do your energy analysis. And it can be a bit of an iterative cycle. So I talked about integrated design before. So you may be looking at all these things together if you really want to optimize that facade. The other thing that you want to think about when you're looking at loads in a building is not just the peak load and the peak, peak heating load and the peak cooling load for sizing equipment. If you're thinking about energy, you want to know what those loads are going to be 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, if you really want to optimize that. Because if you can start to understand when heating is needed and when cooling is needed, and how much of it is needed, you can start to look at other strategies you can do as well. So this is a building that's actually an office building down on uh, Marginal Way in Seattle. We're doing it for the Army Corps of Engineers. I'm not showing you the building, I'm showing you a slide. 365 days of the year, the BTUs per square foot of heating or cooling that's needed, and this is, these are basically, this is hourly profiles, but it's all scrunched down to days. So the red is heating, and the blue is cooling. And so you can see that in the wintertime, you still have some cooling to do, and that's because the interior of the building still has heat gains that you have to offset versus the perimeter where you have to do heating. So there's an overlap there. So it's like, hmm, what else do we know? Well, the other thing we probably know is that most of the heating that happens this time of the year, or in an office building like this, doesn't happen in the middle of the day when everyone's there, and the lights are on, and the equipment is on, and they're doing whatever they're doing. Most of it happens at night, or when they first turn the building on and they want to warm it up. Whereas the cooling, most of that cooling at that time of year happens probably during the middle of the day and towards the end of the day. So they happen at different points in time. So for this particular building, we said, if we could figure out a way to store energy and move it on a daily basis back and forth between heating and cooling, maybe that would be pretty cool. So we actually came up with an idea, a thermal storage idea on this project, where we were using a, a phase change media that's not ice, but it's like ice, and it freezes at 58 degrees. And so we have this big tank it contains these wafers of this phase change material that freezes at 58 degrees and the big tank's full of water that circulates through it. And so what we do at night and in the morning is we circulate water through that tank and melt ice, or melt this, this flat ice, this, this salt, at 58 degrees. Then we get 58 degrees water coming out. That 58 degree water then feeds a heat pump that produces 110 degree water, 120 degree water, that's perfect temperature for our low temperature heating system. And in the process of doing that, it's extracting um, uh, heat from this ice, excuse me, and freezing the ice in the process of doing that. So what we do is we run this heat pump at night, and in the morning we're doing heating, and we're extracting heat from this ice stuff and freezing it. Then during the daytime, we got this tank, and it's full of this, these wafers that contain this ice, 58 degrees melts, and we circulate water through that tank, and we get 58 degree water, which is the perfect temperature for cooling in the interior of the building. And so we're all, we don't turn off our boilers, we don't need boilers, we're using this heat pump, and it's only because we understand when the loads are that we can do that strategy. There's a few other things in here too, but that's the concept. What's that? That's pretty cool. Yeah. All right, Z-Home. Let's take it back to the Z-Home project now. By the way, your pizza should be here. I want to see it. Good. 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 You guys want to grab your pizza? It's warm, still, maybe. We can take a break. Sure. It'll stay warm for a while. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Get your, get your food. 
back? Is that how you do it? I don't know. We usually have pizza right after the um, after the speaking. We kind of break out, have pizza, oh. and well, I, talk. I, I, actually, this is a breaking point. I'm going to call it a breaking point. That's all ways to go. All right. So why don't, why don't you guys grab Let's pizza? Take a little break. Take a little break. I probably got, I could go 20 or half an hour more or a little bit more than that. Do that.